children and men, was sitting around him, and they said to him, Look, your mother and your sisters and brothers are outside asking for you. And Jesus replied, Who are my mother and my sisters and my brothers? And looking at those around him sitting in a circle, he said, Here are my mother and my siblings. Whoever does the will of God is my sibling and my sister and my brother and mother. The Gospel of the Lord. Through the written word and the spoken word, God, help us to hear your living word, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Say hey to all my friends. That's basically what Paul is saying in the portion of his letter to the Romans that we hear today. Paul has offered stories, teachings, he's given communal advice to the Romans, and he concludes his writing with this list of friends and co-workers in ministry. Paul names about 30 co-workers. The Jesus movement is full of active members. Just as Jesus appointed the 12 in our gospel passage, Paul includes many fellow leaders in the church. Reverend Dr. Will Gaffney refers to each of these passages as peopling the movement. The Jesus movement is embodied. It has faces and names, particular gifts and ministries. These passages of peopling remind us that God is not simply an abstract force but the work of God's people as the body of Christ in the world. What I find particularly noteworthy in Paul's list is the women. That's right, this is the same Paul who at other times said women, women should keep quiet and has been con excuse me, quoted as condemning queer relationships. But that's why scripture requires context. It can't be read as singular verses devoid of the full story and history. Paul names women as co-workers in the movement. Phoebe, a deacon and a benefactor of the church. Prissa, who with her husband risked her life for Paul. Mary, who has been working among the Roman community. Junia, Paul's kin and fellow prisoner, a prominent apostle whose faith in Jesus preceded that of Paul's. Tryphena and Tryphosa and Persis, who toil in Christ, plus those sisters and mothers who are not named. Women were active in the early church. Women. Women who in later generations were told that there was no ministerial role for them. That same half of the population that has been put down, stripped of autonomy, and silenced by the church for much of her history. Maybe you have felt a stirring in your heart and then been told that you are not allowed to serve in that particular way. This can happen to any of us regardless of our gender. And that soul-crushing no to a call that you are hearing from God can deny your humanity. It can deny your God-created nature and the voice of God that you are hearing out in the wilderness. So here's a truth that I want to make sure we all hear clearly. It's demonstrated in Paul's letter to the Romans, and it is a deep truth of God's kingdom. For as long as there has been ministry to do, 
there have been women in ministry. For as long as there has been ministry to do, there have been gay people in ministry. There have been transgender and non-binary people in ministry even before we had those words for identities. As long as there has been ministry to do, there have been disabled people in ministry. There have been people who are marginalized by society in ministry. For as long as there has been ministry to do, which is, by the way, forever, the people we often devalue or exclude have been in ministry. I'll focus on the ministry of women. The ministry of women is not new. It's not new. The ordination of women in the institutional church is new for many, but the ministry itself is ancient. Our institutions can chip away at what God has called good. And then those same institutions can angst over restoring power and authority to those who once had it. Our struggle to align ourselves with what God is already doing can make us say some pretty nasty and regrettable things. In 1974, 11 prophetic women, known as the Philadelphia Eleven, stepped into their God-given calls as priests, and they were ordained by retired bishops prior to the Episcopal Church allowing for women's ordination. In response, one man said, the 11 little priestesses in a row, I'd be delighted if they would go away. And another, there's no reason a woman cannot be the president or a judge, but the one thing she cannot be is a model. Still today, plenty would call women priests like myself Jezebels. Even some who welcomed those early women into the priesthood said that their primary contribution was beauty, which accepts women as objects on view, but not as people with authentic ministries. Clearly, these people had not seen the Barbie movie. It would be two more years before the Episcopal Church approved women's ordination, which happened in large part due to these brave and I would say prophetic women. Change, also known as return to ancient practice, can be hard. Living into the boundless love of Jesus is hard. Bishop Jean Robinson said, it's funny, isn't it? that you can preach a judgmental and vengeful and angry God and nobody will mind. But you start preaching a God that is too accepting, too loving, too forgiving, too merciful, too kind, and you are in trouble. Something about this welcoming, loving, affirming, and merciful God, and by extension, the ministry that comes from that God, can feel too big and unwieldy. The boundaries on in-group and out-group fade, which can make us uncomfortable. If we can't decide who is out, then how can we maintain our power? Passages like the one we have from Paul's letter to the Romans remind me of that expansive nature of God and of the people that God calls. We are called by God and made in the image of God, which means that God's image must be as expansive as God's people. An exclusively white male God leads to a narrow understanding of ministry, of call, and of the church. An exclusively white male God 
leads to a narrowing of the church. Our God is bigger than we could ever imagine. Our God is not simply a man. God might be father, but God is also mother, feeding us from her breast, caring for us from her very flesh and blood. God is grandpa sitting in his lazy boy recliner, telling stories of the generations gone by. God is abuela, making sure that no one leaves hungry. God is a child asking big questions that catch us off guard and invite us into a spirit of wonder. God is not white. Whiteness is aligned with power in our world, and God has a particular commitment to the disrespected, unprotected, and neglected. So God is the black boy killed in the street. God is the brown immigrant seeking a path to safety. God is not an old white man with a long white beard. God is not white, nor is God a man. And when God did live in a human male body, he was killed by the state at 33 years old. He didn't have time to grow a long white beard. So perhaps God is a black woman. In her book bearing that title, Dr. Christina Cleveland names, if God is a black woman, then God is a black trans woman, obviously, end quote. Because if God can exist in the most marginalized body, then surely God can be in any body. If God can be black, then God can be explored in all races and all cultures. If God can be a woman, then God can be explored and understood in all genders. If God can be transgender, then God can be explored in ever-expanding bodies, in a growing list of lived realities, in all genders and all sexual identities. God is expansive beyond our comfort, beyond our respectability politics, and beyond our very imaginations. And because our God is expansive, our ministry is expansive. Because each of us are in the image of God, we are called to enact God's kingdom. With all this in mind, I want to offer a poem. It's from the Black Trans Prayer Book. The Blessing of Our Ancestors, Our Praying Grandmothers, by Deja Baptiste. You are not alone. You are not the first or the only. There is a lineage you are inheriting. It is your courage, your faith, your spirit that sets you apart. You are not doomed. We are not cursed. We are the blessed ones, the blessing. We are blessed to know that our spirits are not bound in our skin, flesh, that bodies like names are expressions manifesting the soul we bear outside of time and beyond infinity. There is a lineage here. You were never the first in your family, your hometown, your faith, your lovers loved and were loved by us, the blessed ones. We heard and nurtured our ancestors' dreams. We came forward to create and dream, imagine and plant, live in the physical, what is celebrated and cherished and renewed in the spiritual. 
I'll repeat those last few lines. To live in the physical, what is celebrated and cherished and renewed in the spiritual. You are not alone. Generations have preceded you. The great cloud of witnesses surrounds us. The physical world can take time to catch up with the spiritual, to catch up with what God is already doing. So have courage, knowing that each of us is blessed by God, each of us is called by God, each of us has a ministry that is welcomed by God. And God delights in each of us. Listen for the voice of God. Listen for all of those ministries that have preceded our own and see where God is calling you. Amen.